And, and I'm going to hand it over to Fred right now, who's going to lay some, uh, take us to the, take us to the seashore. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thank you for all the kind words and introduction. I should also uh, just briefly mention the Maryland Entomological Society is also a, a local group that does meet here at the Natural History Society on occasion. We are somewhat affiliated and we do joint meetings and uh, many of our members are also members of the Natural History Society. I'm the president of the Entomological Society as well. Uh, besides curating shells here for the Natural History Society, I'm also involved with the entomology, the fossils and the minerals because I'm kind of a crazy nut and I collect everything and I love it. So, and Bronwyn's right. What a great place to get locked in the basement. I would love that. <laughs> so um, if we could, uh, Bronwyn, uh, look at the PowerPoint, then I'll just begin with that. And um, everybody can hear me as I uh, go through some of the things on the PowerPoint. And then we're going to briefly, in between slides, uh, we'll go back to the camera so I can show you examples of the things I'm talking about. Okay, so <clears throat> as we see here, the phylum mollusca has seven classes of, um, of mollusks in it. And these in total number second only to insects. Insects, of course, are the biggest group of invertebrates on earth by far by far. And among the insects, the beetles seem to outnumber everything by far. But when we talk about overall numbers, the mollusks come in second. Um, it's a little bit of a distant second, but nevertheless second as far as overall species on the planet. So we have seven classes in the phylum. And I know you've heard of some of these before, but let's just go through them. Gastropods or univalves are all the snail-like mollusks, okay? Bivalves, clams, and shells have two two-part hinges, not to be confused with brachiopods, which are lamp shells. They're not mollusks at all, actually. Uh, and there's only a couple species alive on the planet. Uh, they're fossil uh, groups mostly, the, the brachiopods. But bivalves are huge, big group. Cephalopods, uh, they're pretty big too because that includes octopi, squids, and cuttlefish. And the ones with the shells, of course, are the nautilus, right? Um, so next slide, please. And Bronwyn, if we can um, minimize the, uh, the faces because uh, some, somebody said they can't see the, the entire um, PowerPoint because the images are on the screen. Is that possible? That you need to, to handle in what in your own personal viewing. So if the if at the top of your screen you have some options if to do presenter view, show grid video, um, and then you can you can toggle through. Um, okay, so it, each person can do that on their own. That's correct. Okay, all right. So uh, I don't know who it was that said they couldn't see. I'm not sure why they can't see, but if it's because of the, uh, their own images that are there, then they, they can hide that on their computer. Um, yes, the answer is yes, cuttlefish are mollusks and they have an internal shell. I'll, I'll talk about that momentarily. So far we have said gastropods, bivalves, and we said cephalopods. So the remaining four classes Scaphopods, which are tusk shells. Scapho means boat in Greek, so boat foot. And they burrow into the sand. They do look like little elephant tusks and they're really neat. And there's quite a few of them. Um, and the uh, main genus is dentalium. So it speaks of tooth, right? Um, Polyplacophora, which are chitons. These are rock dwelling mollusks that have eight plates. They look like a little trilobite and they live on rocks and they scrape the algae off of rocks in tidal zones and they stick very hard to rocks. You need a sharp knife blade to pull them off. Um, and there's many different ones. 
Um, there's cold water ones that get pretty big, actually, four inches. And there's a lot of tropical ones. Um, the monoplacophora, single plate carriers, what that means, these are gastroverms, another word for them. And they come from very deep water, like 3,000 feet deep. Now, the shell itself looks like a little limpet shell. And these were thought to be extinct until one was dredged up at 3,000 feet in 1957 by a Danish um, expedition off the coast of uh, Western Mexico, I believe it was. Now, um, I've never even seen one except maybe at a museum, monoplacophora. There are not very many. They're extremely rare and there's only a few species, like I think four, maybe five. And then the aplacophora is a uh, worm-like mollusk with no shell. They're also called solenogasters. Um, and I've never seen one of those myself. I've only read about them. Okay, next slide, please. So we'll talk about the gastropods first, and I'm just going to go through these uh, well-known families that have numerous species in them, hundreds of species in some cases. So the first one is Strombidae, the conchs. Some people call whelks conchs and conchs whelks. So, um, but um, the, the, the common name is conchs and there's a bunch of them. So I'm gonna go through this slide and then after we're done on this, I'm gonna show you examples of these four groups and then we'll do the next slide. So in the Caribbean, we have some nice conchs, the big queen conchs, fighting conchs, milk conchs, hot wing conchs, I have these here to show you. And of course the queen conch is a food resource throughout the Caribbean in Florida. Most of these species are edible. You could probably eat any of them, but the queen conch is a big, shell, so there's lots of food in there, lots of meat. And you might have heard of conch fritters, crack conch or steam conch and all these, there's a bunch of recipes, there's stews and soups, and they're all delicious. I've had many, many uh, varieties of uh, preparation, all good. And um, they're uh, easily depleted because, you know, you can overfish them. In Florida, they're protected. Uh, they were depleted and almost wiped out by people. So, um, so I'm trying to read some of these texts. Oh, okay. Um, somebody wants to be admitted. Good, okay. The Conidae, cone shells. This is a worldwide distribution again, and there are venomous ones. The cones have a uh, siphon uh, part of their animal, the, the, uh, the extension of the uh, animal's foot, there's a siphon on it. Uh, all, all of the mollusks have a siphon. These gastropods do have siphons. And in the case of the cone shell, the siphon is actually modified to have a dart-like apparatus, which they can shoot this little dart at a fish that's close up to them, obviously, but they can shoot it with a little venomous darts like a sting and it kills the fish and they eat it. People have been known to be stung by them. When they collected them, they didn't realize that they were uh, moving and alive. If the animals retracted in the shell, it may not bother you, but they can. Um, uh, they are, conchs, by the way, conchs are carnivorous too. Uh, somebody just put a chat up, so I'm reading these as we go along. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, the cones, I'm going to show you some examples of those momentarily, and I have a few of the venomous ones to show you what they look like too. Um, cowrie shells, the Cypraeidae, are the ones with the high gloss dome-shaped shell, and they have a slit-like aperture. Um, these are among the more beautiful shells that are out there. Well, they're all beautiful to me, but um, there's people who only collect cowrie shells, you know, or only collect cones and stuff, which is probably wise because shells can be a big, big endeavor if you're going to try to collect everything. Um, and so the last group on this slide is the Cassidae, the helmet shells and bonnet shells. 
Uh, many of these are large, heavy, boxy shells, and they are among the largest growing shells in the world. Okay, so four families. Now, if we'll just uh, minimize the PowerPoint, Bronwyn, there, and we'll go to the camera. And I'm going to start off with the Strombidae, and there's a queen conch. And I'm sure that everybody has seen these, right? If you want to see it better, if you put it in speaker view, then Fred will become the ba major person on the screen and, and get out of the uh, Brady Bunch view, if you'd like. How do we do that? That's on, that's each person will oh, each person. hold that at the, at the top of their, makes that yeah. choice. Yeah. Well, that would be good if you want to see the shell better. Yeah. So these are huge, you can see, and they have this big wing. And in the Caribbean, when they fish them, they take an ax and they chop a slit right in the spire. This is called the spire, the point. So they cut a hole and that releases the, uh, breaks the vacuum. And then they turn it this way and yank the animal out. And these beautiful shells often are just discarded. Uh -huh. And you can see places in the Caribbean where there's piles as tall as you are, big piles of these shells were just thrown away um, and be, they're very common, so nobody cares, and they don't use them for anything. Although I've seen people make uh, decorative walls with these shells cemented into the wall and things like that. But anyway, so that's a queen conch. And then we have the, um, the milk conch, very similar, but smaller. It's kind of pinkish on the outside. And it has a beautiful aperture. We have the um, fighting conch. And there's two varieties of these. Let's see if I can tip my camera like that. Was that is that better? You all let me know if what's, what works best for this camera to see it. If I need to come closer, somebody yell out. But um, the Florida fighting conch is characterized by the dark inside the lip. The West Indian fighting conch is more orange and a little smaller in size. And um, this, the common name, for the, uh, I'm sorry, the scientific name is Strombus pugilis, which means fighting, because this is what they do. They are carnivorous and they fight and so on and so forth. Uh, very common, very pretty shells. If you find them alive, they're always nicer. And the hawkwing conch, another species that's abundant in Florida in the grass flats, you see these. All these conches, by the way, that I've just showed you are all found in shallow water in grass flats. So you can snorkel around and see them if you're uh, in a place where, where that's possible. Um, and they, their range is basically warm water, so we're not gonna see them up here. Uh, maybe up into uh, Northern Florida, some of these, right? But once you get down into South Florida and the Keys, yeah, you'll see a lot of those. And of course, in the Caribbean. Now, the Strombidae also include a group called the spider conches, which are from the Indo-Pacific region. And these are characterized by these projections. They basically have the same lip, but they have all these projections on them. And um, they're very pretty and they can be very common. This is a scorpion conch, it's the, the, the common name. Lambus is the genus, Lambus chiagra. And then we have this one, which is another type of spider conch, another Lambus. Again, this is fairly common one too, but they're absolutely gorgeous. I, I'm sure some of you who are familiar with shells, you probably have seen some of these. But did you know that they can get big? Here's a great big one, look at that. Um, this is uh, the uh, extent, or they can, they can even be bigger than this, which is a, the size of a queen conch, which is phenomenal. Uh, I have found them when I was uh, diving in the Indian Ocean uh, in Kenya, great big ones, and um, I left them there, but, uh, I remember them well right here, so that's all I need, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, they're beautiful shells, and they are sold commercially. You could go to any beach town and find these spider conches for sale in the beach shop, you know, those souvenir stores, they sell cowries, they sell all these things. 
Uh, some of them are overfished. They still seem to be fine in plenty of them, but it's hard to know what, what may happen because mollusks can be depleted rather easily. Okay, so the next group I mentioned were the uh, cone shells. So cone shells typically are shaped like this. And you can see the aperture, a narrow aperture. The spire is very short and flat and they almost have a flat face to them, which you can see. And here is a bigger version of one of these cone shells, very pretty. And they're um, abundant. These are not rare at all. This is called the marble cone, Conus marmoreus. Um, I have found these in Indonesia when I was traveling there. There's common, and these are found in the Indo-Pacific, in Hawaii, and I have found great big ones in Hawaii when I was there. But um, they're heavy when they get to be this size, especially down here. This part is very thick. And you can see the spire is almost flat in some of these. Now I'll show you the venomous ones too. Here's another one. This looks like the uh, alphabet cone that we get in Florida. If any of you ever looked in Florida uh, for shells, you may have seen these. Okay, alphabet cones are pretty, pretty well, I'd say fairly abundant. You have to know where to look. Um, and the venomous ones are these. You have the geography cone, Conus geographus. This a, has a little bigger aperture, you can see. And here's a textile cone, and it's, these are beautiful. You can see the patterning on that. Again, the spires are short, not quite as short and flat as the other ones I showed you, but you can still see. And the geography cone, this one here has been known to cause fatalities by people getting stung. And the siphon is on this side, the open side here. So the animal travels, if you will, in this direction, going this way. So the spire is out in the front, not the spire, I'm sorry, the siphon is out in the front over here and it's traveling this way. The spire is in the back. So when they sting, there's a little tube that comes out, the siphon, and the siphon has a dart that fires out and shoots at the prey. And people have unfortunately been stung by these things and some have died. Um, I think it really depends on the amount of venom that you receive and also a person's uh, own immune system and such that some are more allergic to things than others. So you know how that goes. This is another one, Conus striatus. This is another uh, toxic one. Again, you can see beautiful colors. And the uh, cone shells, some of the rare ones are like the glory of the seas cone. The glory of India cone can fetch hundreds of dollars for a large specimen. They're gorgeous shells. I have glory of the seas cone in my collection, but not the other one. And um, the thing about rare shells is that uh, they sometimes find more of them. Therefore, they're not as rare as people think, or they're just inaccessible. And then sometimes the habitat starts to become more accessible. For example, when scuba diving came around, suddenly all kinds of shells started surfacing that people would find that they'd never found before. And, uh, you know, deep sea fishing, trawling, traps, these shells that can be baited or they can just enter a fish trap sometimes and they're, got, they're gotten that way. So those are cones. And now I'll show you the cowries and we'll move on. So the cowries are basically these shells that have the high gloss. And you can see that. They're absolutely stunning. They're characterized by this very tight uh, ribbed aperture. 
Now this is a common one called the tiger carry, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Tiger carries are sold in all these little stores. These are fetching about maybe one or two dollars. That's it, you know, for a one about this size. They're not rare. They're one of the more abundant carries. And, you know, people like them for souvenirs. So they're easily obtainable. But this is a typical um, feature that slit right down the middle. So the, the, uh, the spire is almost non-existent on these. I'll show you what's left of a spire. Okay, here's a deer cowrie. This is from Florida. It has these beautiful chocolate color with the white spots, which I hope you can maybe see in the camera. They can be bigger than this. This is a small deer cowrie. In fact, the deer cowrie is the biggest of all the cowries in the world, right in Florida. Seven inches, they get huge. Now the spire is what's this little button that's left here, which if you can see, that's all that's left of the spire. So in this design, the spire is reduced to next to nothing. And the siphon is on that side right here. So the shell travels in this direction again, with the siphon in the front and the spire toward the back. Um, Here's another beautiful cowrie. I got this one in Zanzibar when I was there a couple years ago. This is a, a Mo cowrie, I believe. Um, and this one is the tortoise cowrie, Cypraea testudinaria. This is a gorgeous one. This is a huge one. You can see there's the slit again. Here's what's left of the spire. You can hardly see anything there. Um, and it's a Fabulous shell, not expensive if you wanted to buy one, but a big one like this is hard to come by. Now the Holy Grail. Some carries are very rare and very pricey. Here's one, for example. That's a golden cowrie. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a golden cowrie, but feast your eyes on it. No, you can't have it. <laughs> this one is from the Philippines from the island of Mindanao. They're found across the South Pacific. Um, the island of Fiji, uh, the chiefs would wear it around their neck. So they put a little hole like this and they would wear, this is the, the symbol of the chief because it was rare and very sought after, only the chief would wear it. Anyway, uh, a large one of these, this is, a, this is a good size one, but not as big as they get. Uh, they get bigger and more domed, they would be worth $500 for this shell, easily. I have a very nice one that I'm very proud of, and I'm happy with it. <laughs> so these are examples of cowries, and they're little cowries, you know, that people heard of as called money cowries. Uh, there's a whole lot of cowries. Cowries have been used by many cultures for artwork for monetary purposes and um, so on and so forth. Um, so we could go back to the PowerPoint now and I can mention a few more families, okay? I'll try to go a little faster. So let's go down to slide number four. One more, there we go. So some more gastropods. Murex shells are the ones that have spiny projections. There's a boatload of Murex shells. Volutes are very pretty, very shiny. They can have all kinds of really interesting patterns on them. There's some very rare ones. Tritons, I'm sure people know about tritons, the trumpet shells, they call them. You see them in the movie sometimes and the South Sea Islanders are blowing on a trumpet shell. Uh, I have one here, I'll show you a smaller size one. Olive shells, I put that in there, Olividae, because you can find these uh, in North Carolina. We have a lot of olive shells. Um, and the Melongenidae, the whelks, um, we have a lot of these here on, in Maryland all the way up to New York um, and even past. So, and they're used as a food resource. If anybody's Italian, who's Italian? 
No Italians? Maybe there's somebody they're not saying. How about this? Have you heard of scongili? It's an Italian salad. And it's very tasty. They put this whelks, they chop them up, they cook them, chop them up and put them in a can. Or if people have them fresh, they would put them in. It's a uh, traditional New Year's salad, but you know, you can eat it any time of the year if you want. And it's quite good. So if you go to the fish market, you will see whelks for sale, sometimes bushel baskets full of them. Uh, they're very popular among the um, <clears throat> Oriental folks, they like those a lot, um, but not just them, uh, uh, other people buy them too. But uh, in New Jersey, there's actually a Italian facility uh, that cooks and processes whelks and they put it in a can and it's called scongili. Okay, next slide. Now, what can you find on the beach? Moon shells, naticidae, these are uh, common and uh, kind of rounded shells. I know uh, some people know them. Um, fasciolaridae, by the way, the, I'm sorry, the moon snails wash up on the beaches sometimes in great numbers after a big storm. You'll see them all the way up in Long Island, all over the place. Um, the fasciolaridae are the tulip shells. This is more like Florida and into the Carolinas. Uh, the Bucinidae, there are small whelks. We have a few of those in our area. If you're from New England, you've probably seen this one called a Neptune shell or a Neptune whelk. It's a Bucinidae, actually. Uh, Turritellas, um, the slipper shells, these are found in numbers on the beaches too. Little slipper shells or cup and saucers, you might have found them beachcombing. Crepudulidae, uh, little top shells are the Trochidae. Miter shells and cerus, dove shells, periwinkles, nerites, bubble shells, limpets. Each of these is a family. Therefore, would have a number, a great number of species in that family. Uh, too numerous to mention here, but I just wanted to give you guys a rundown on things that you could maybe find in this groups on our beaches and in the Carolinas plenty of these are washing up and, and uh, people find them after storms and stuff, okay? So now if we could, let's just jet back to the camera and I'll show you real fast. So here's a beautiful Murex. And if you can see, look at the projections on that guy. That's a gorgeous one. This is Chikorius. This is a really nice one. This is from the Indo-Pacific area. Um, it is not a rare one and a nice one with pretty projections like this, you know, you could, you could buy these if you wanted to have a nice one. They're not expensive. The bigger they are and the cleaner they are and the nicer that the, the price goes up accordingly, just like a lot of other things. Okay. Now <clears throat> here's one of the famous ones. And I have to be very careful with this. This is called the Venus comb murex. And you can see why it's called a comb. It looks just like a comb. Maybe it even looks like a fish backbone with all the ribs in it, you know, if you take a fish apart. But um, these are from the Philippines and they are exquisite shells and they're hard to find a good perfect one and the more perfect they are the more you'll pay for it if you're buying one but they're a gorgeous shell and maybe one of the best known in this family the venus comb murex certainly a beautiful species so um i've showed you some of the pretty ones um Murexes, there are a few species that get quite large, um, not as big as those big conchs that I showed you, but still, you know, a good size uh, for a Murex shell. Here's one right here. That's a pretty good size one. And this is a East Coast species. I believe this is the lace Murex that you can find. I have found these diving in um, 
North Carolina on the shipwrecks. So we we're pretty far out, like 10 miles offshore, and they turn up on the shipwrecks. Again, you can see here, there's the spire on this side, and here's the siphon over here. So the shell is gonna travel like this, siphon forward, right? The trick with these, if you find them, is to get them clean without breaking them and preserving the, the exquisite structure. Okay. Um, so the, um, the tritons, let's see, I have a few tritons here. Here's a nice trumpet triton. And you've, may have you, many of you have seen these again, but they're uh, one of the prize collection. People always like to get these in their collection. The, the Coronia variegata is the name. Now this is the, the, the one that occurs in Greece, in the Mediterranean waters. There's a Caribbean that the Caribbean variety, the shoulder up here would be raised up more, a little knobbier, if you will. And then there's the Pacific uh, species, which is bigger yet and has a more flaring lip. And these are interesting animals because they feed on starfish. And they are, in the Pacific, the only known predator for the crown of thorns Starfish, which are huge, if you've ever seen a crown of thorns, they're two feet across. They're enormous starfish, and they get on the coral reef, and they strip the polyps right out of the coral. And when there's an infestation of them, these starfish destroy the coral reef. Now, the tritons, which get as big as your arm in there, are the predator who will kill the starfish and eat it. So it's nice to have them around as a balance. And unfortunately, the balance gets disrupted in, you know, what happens then. So a lot of reefs have had damages because of these starfish. Now, um, tulip shells, the fasciolaridae, here's some big, this is a pretty good size tulip shell. And this is probably from Florida. Um, this came from the collection downstairs. Uh, and that's, the, reaching about the limit of the size. This, this one's at least six inches across, maybe a little more. And here's a smaller one. And these are common. I would wager that if any of you have been looking for shells, you found these before. And in, in they get cast up on the beach and everything. And they're one of the more common shells on the grass flats in Florida, tulip shells. There's a few different species of them. There's one real deep water one in the Gulf of Mexico. I've never found it or collected it. It's called Branham's Tulip. It's sort of white with chocolate lines on it. Pretty cool. But these are the common ones, Fasciolaridae, okay? Um, a, re a relative is the spindle shell. Look at that. This is a gorgeous one. This one came from Zanzibar when I was there a couple of years ago. Um, we have four or five species of spindles in South Florida and in the Caribbean. They're rare. You're not gonna find one. And they come from deep water. But they're, they're beautiful shells. So we mentioned helmet shells, Cassidae. So let me show you a example. This is a small one. This is an emperor helmet, and you can see boxy, large, and it has this big lip. The spire is short and flattened, and the siphon has this upturned little structure here. Let's see, there it is, see? Always at the end of the shell, they have this upturned siphonal canal, it's called. So from what I've showed you thus far, you can see like in the spindle, the siphon is huge. It's long and thin. In the tulip shell, the siphon is fairly large. And in some shells, 
the siphon is like reduced, like in the Kauri, you don't really see that. So helmets now, this one's from North Carolina. I found this diving in, in the, in the uh, shipwrecks. But look how big they can get in South Florida. That's a monster. And this is about as big as they get. They may be slightly bigger than that even, but that's, that's a full size one. And here's by comparison, the difference. These are protected in Florida now. You can still see them if you're diving, but they're, they're beautiful shells. And the animals bury themselves in sandy areas out on the reefs where there's sandy patches. They'll burrow down into the sand and just the very, very edge of these knobs will show. And if you're astute enough to see it, that's how you'll find it. Now we have other species in the Caribbean. We have the king helmet, which instead of rounded lip, it has a squared off lip and a little different color, more chocolate in here and not as quite as round, but big boxy knobs on the top here. Okay, protuberances are much bigger on the king helmet. There's a horned helmet in the Pacific, which gets huge like this too. And it is also um, uh, an orange color on the front. And here is a neat one. That's called the bull mouth helmet. And if you know what this is, this helmet, these come from the Indian Ocean. I've seen a lot of these in, Mata, in um, Zanzibar when I was there. What they do with these in the old days, and they probably st they still do this, the very top <clears throat> is carved. This is where cameos come from. So the cameo jewelry that people would wear those beautiful pictures, you know, the Victorian lady that's carved comes from this shell. So this is also called the cameo shell or the cameo helmet. Okay. But it's a bull mouth helmet to be sure. Now, there's other species of helmets which are rare. Um, I've mentioned a few here only, um, but I want to show you some other groups as well. So whelks, when we mentioned the whelk, I know all of you probably found a whelk on the beach somewhere, right? And they're common and we said they're eaten for food and all that. Well, here's, here's how big a whelk can get. Look at this one. This is from, uh, I think this one came out of Florida, but they get huge. And there's the lightning whelk, there's a left-handed whelk, there's uh, two species that we get in Maryland. Busicon, busicon is the common whelks that you find. And then if you get the one that's more rounded, busicon canaliculatum, the channeled whelk. Those two species are found frequently. There's one, yeah, canaliculatum, good. There you go. That's the one, Karen's got it. Okay, Karen, <laughs> good job. So they get big too. Have you ever seen a big one? They get huge. And have you ever eaten one? Time to make some scongeli, right? <laughs> All right. Now, volutes. I have some volutes here. And these are among, again, some of the highly prized shells that collectors want. So there are many kinds. In our waters, we don't get too many. We have a few. We have the one that everybody wants is called Juno's Volute, the Junonia. And they're not common at all. And when somebody finds one at the beach, like in Sanibel Island, which is famous for beach combing, everybody's like, reporting it up and down the coast. It makes all the newspapers, right? <laughs> but let me show you a few other ones. So here is one from Australia called the wavy line volute. 
They're very pretty. Amoria undulata, the wavy line volute. You see, they have a very shiny surface and the inside, the aperture is also very shiny and pretty, right? So Amoria angelata is not a rare one, but it's a very pretty one, nevertheless. And I was lucky when I was in Tasmania, I found one that was left-handed. It winds the other way, which is extremely rare to find one like that for these species. Okay, here's a common volute now. This one, I forgot the name of it, forgive me. It's a, it is a common species though. And um, it's a very pretty example, it's shiny. This is all natural shine, by the way, all natural. Here is another uh, Indo-Pacific volute. This is a, a very typical shape of a volute. They have an elongated spire, all here typically elongated. You see all of these have that, right? And the, the shape of the shell is also elongated. They can be very pretty though. The imperial volute from the Philippines is one of the most beautiful volutes. Now related to them are the harp shells. If you've ever seen these, they are absolutely stunning. And they're not rare. There are a few species that are really rare, which I cannot afford, <laughs> nor will I buy them. <laughs> but they're very pretty, they're typical. Look at the pattern, I'm gonna see if that works. Yeah, I guess that's not too bad. You can see all in between the ribs, you can see beautiful patterning, right? Here's the one from Zanzibar that I got, look at that. Fred, I want to. Um, I don't want to stop you. But I just want to let you know that we're we're at the seven fifty mark. Wow! Time yeah. flies when you have fun. Okay. Time flies when you're playing with shells. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, that's enough of those. Let's uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint, and I'll proceed there. And I think because this was the slides that took the longest, so I think the rest we can accomplish rather quickly. So. If we can shoot back to the PowerPoint then. All right, let's go to the next. All right, the bivalves, again, um, all kinds of commercially harvested bivalves, quahogs, cherry steamers, razor clams and oysters, and of course, Atlantic Bay and calico scallops and deep sea scallops are all harvested commercially. Um, if you ever go to a place where they do this uh, for the scallops, you can you can grab all the shells you want. There's dozens and they throw them away. Um, now on the beaches, when you're like in Ocean City or in uh, North Carolina, you're gonna find arc shells cast up on the beach all the time. They look like clams with deep ribs. Venus clams, jewel box, telons, and then angel wings. Now those are just how they sound. They look like elongated white angel wings and they are very delicate. They generally get broken up when a storm hits, they get smashed up and, um, you know, but you can sometimes find good ones. Uh, and if you dig, you have to dig about two feet into the sand to find them alive, you can. Uh, pen shells are warm water shells. Uh, they get cast up on the beaches in numbers. There's an angel wing, good, Karen. Where'd you get that one? Is that from uh, North Carolina? Florida, Ocean City, I can't hear you, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can type it later if you want. But yeah, those are nice. If you find in them, that's really good because they get broken a lot of times. Um, the pen shells anchor themselves into the sand about two thirds. They're shaped like these triangulate type shapes and they anchor down into the sand and the, the shell is like this sticking out and they're open like that. In the old days, they used to use the abyssal threads. Abyssal threads are the threads that hold them to, to the substrate. And the medieval ages, they pulled out these great big pen shells. They were like 18 inches and they would use the abyssal threads to weave gloves because it's a silk-like material. Only the royalty and nobility could afford those. 
Now, if you're in Florida after a storm, you will find pan shells, smaller ones that are just cast up on the beach all over the place. They're pretty common. Uh, they're found throughout the Caribbean and other places in the world too. Spiny oysters, not related to the eating kind of oysters. These are spondylus with beautiful projections. I'll show you a couple of those. They're anchored in the reefs on rocks and structures like shipwrecks. And then of course, the giant clams, which are the largest of all bivalves. Okay, back to the camera real quick. Uh, Bronwyn, thank you. Um, here is a spiny oyster. I'll show you that. And this is two parts. There's many species. This is a really pretty one. There's some that are all red, some that are all white. There's some that have small projections, some that have large projections. There's a, a, a variety of different species. Some are deep water, some are reefs, and others are from shipwrecks. Um, so I have found them many times and they're typically anchored somewhere where you have to be able to get them off without breaking them or don't leave or just don't bother with them. <laughs> um, here is a giant cockle shell. Cockles are in, come in all kinds of colors, yellow, pinks, white, and uh, there's many species of cockles. There's cockles that are sold for food. Uh, it's a European thing, cockles. You know, they're, they're kind of black though. It's kind of weird because when you eat the meat from these ones that they sell at the fish markets in Europe, they're black and it turns the food dark because they have like a ink sort of thing in them. They're good though, don't get me wrong, um, but I've eaten better seafood than that. <laughs> So these big cockles, you can see these are, these are quite large. Sometimes you'll find these after a storm too, in, in the, from the Carolinas on down to Florida. And sometimes you'll find these on the beach too. This is a sunray telon, very pretty one. I don't have the other half, unfortunately. Um, and a giant clam. There's one valve of a giant clam. This is a small one, a very small one. Well, I wouldn't say very small, but uh, it's a, still a young one. When these get full grown, they weigh 400 pounds and you need a winch to get them out. Uh, unfortunately, the adductor muscle which is like what we call the scallop. When you eat scallops, you're eating an adductor muscle. It's the muscle that pulls the, the bivalve shut. These are highly sought after in Japan and they pay top dollar. So there are people in Indonesia and Philippines, there's a whole crew. You'll have 30 guys on a little boat. They come to a reef and they all jump in the water and they swim wearing mask and fins and they dive down and they have a big knife and they cut the animal right in. They're anchored in the reef this way, facing down with the, this, this part is anchored in the coral. The top part is sticking out and they're just open like that. So they'll stick the knife in there and cut the adductor muscle and strip the meat out of the shell and leave the shell behind and collect all of them that they can find on the reef and it's depleting them. So somebody teach these guys how to raise chickens for God's sake. Anyway, um, in the interest of time, let's go to the PowerPoint again. And we'll go to the next slide. And the cephalopods, again, as we said before, octopi, squid, cuttlefish, and many are harvested commercially, of course. The argonaut or the paper nautilus is a pelagic species with a specialized superb egg case. It's not really a true shell because the animal's not exactly connected to it, but it is a shell. 
And the, of course, squids and cuttlefish have an inner backbone, which is considered a vestigial shell, but no outer shell. Now, the nautilus, on the other hand, a squid-like animal living in a shell, most well known, of course, is the chambered nautilus, and a large number of fossil species known since the Cambrian period, almost 500 million years ago is when they first began finding the fossils. They go that far back, Cambrian. That's as early as you can get with fossils, pretty much people. And they uh, had their heyday during the Ordovician 400 million years ago. And then by 70 million years, most all of them were extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. When the dinosaurs disappeared, they did too except four or five species that exist today. I'll show you those momentarily. And the ammonites, again, speaking of cephalopods, these are no longer, they were the largest group of ancient cephalopods. And they lived for millions of years from the late Paleozoic until again to the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs, except that they disappeared altogether. Some of these were huge. If you can imagine an ammonite, which looks like a coiled nautilus in a sense, to be eight to 10 feet in diameter or bigger, that's phenomenal. And the same with the nautilus. There was one that was 15 feet across. I can't imagine a shell that big, but I'd love to have one. <laughs> okay, uh, back to camera real quick and then we'll finish up, okay? Um, I'll show you guys some cool stuff now, okay. So here is a nautilus. That's a chambered nautilus. It has an aperture like we see here. There the squid would live in here in this part. And they travel like this. They go backwards. Just, and they, they use a jet propulsion type of, like a squid does, and they travel like that. They can also go up and down because the chambers inside are able to be flooded and refilled with gas or air to, to control buoyancy. They live in pretty deep water, but they can be found in, in bait traps. They can get them all the time. Now, this is one species of Nautilus. The New Caledonia from out there in the Pacific has a deep button right in here. It's like a deep channel. And, that's, and there's two kinds. One has a, a little bit of a, of a umbilicus, they're called. And the other species is a very deep umbilicus. So those are two different kinds. This is a third kind. And this is the common chambered nautilus, right? Now what people do with these for tourists, they cut them in half and you can see the chambers. And you see the chambers, let me get my hand out of the way. They go all the way around and there's a little tube See the tube, I don't know if that's coming through, but in here, and that's how the chambers can be flooded or filled with air to control the buoyancy. So that's what they look like when they're cut in half. And this is a, a common thing done to sell at the tourist shops because it's so cool and neat, right? <laughs> All right, now, All right, people, fasten your seat belts on this one. That's a paper nautilus. Here's the opening. And you can see it is paper, paper thin. My daughter asked me, Daddy, are you sure you want to take that to show tonight? And I said, well, I probably shouldn't, but I want to show people something really cool. So this is a $500 shell, my friends. I didn't pay that much for it, luckily. And it is exquisite. And once the females only use this, it's like a little octopus that lives in here. It's called an argonaut. And she lays her eggs in there and when they're done with the eggs and they're hatched, the shell is discarded and that's the end of that. It is a pelagic species, means open ocean. 
and they frequently get cast ashore and smashed to bits, so you'll never find one, unless you're <coughs> very lucky. But anyway, I'm very lucky because I have a, such a nice one. Indeed. Karen, are you jealous? <laughs> All right. So back to the PowerPoint, and I can wrap up for you guys, okay? Um, for people who don't know a lot about shells, we'll just mention that how they grow. They grow uh, as they start out from an egg. There's a tiny little shell called the nuclear whorl. That's how they'll, the gastropods are starting out. And that is the very first shell, the nuclear shell, to which it continues to add and grow in one direction. Successive layers or whorls are added by the mantle of the animal. And that's true for the bivalves too. So that's an membranous skin that extends from the body and secretes the calcium carbonate knacker which builds the next going layer and the continuation, if you will, of the shell. So as they get bigger, the mantle adds another ring, like growth rings on a tree almost, okay? And they continue to do that. On some shells, like when we were looking at them, I don't know if you guys can still see the, what I'm holding up, but you can see the different ribs. Each rib that you see on the surface of the shell is a growth ring, if you will. On the cowrie shells, the shiny, shiny cowrie shell, you can't see that. Why? Because they don't do it that way. The cowrie shells grow from the outside. They put a huge layer on the outside, and then they have an acid inside that eats the interior, making more room for the shell to continue growing. So that's a different process. But the other ones, you can see the actual growth rings, if you will. All right. Um, next slide. And you can tell how old they are, of course, sometimes by those growth rings. Now, needless to say, water content must have a good amount of calcium carbonate for them to build the shell. And that's lately, uh, we're seeing problems in certain places in the world where the pollution is, uh, I think it's carbon dioxide sink into the water that is creating the acidity problem. And when, when the water, when seawater becomes acidified, uh, it depletes the calcium carbonate and then they can't uh, adequately produce the shell. This is, of course, a bigger problem for coral building organisms and some crustaceans too. So uh, I hope we don't see more of that, but that's some of the problems that the modern day earth is facing. It's not just climate change, but this ocean acidification may turn out to be a huge problem as well. Next slide. Beach combing now. So most people walking along the beach and oh, there's some shells that you know, they get cast up and that's how a lot of folks find shells, right? Um, and um, children are always fascinated and can be uh, entertained for hours by walking down the beach and trying to find shells. Um, now that can work well after a storm or a high tide. So um, there are some places that produce loads of shells. I mentioned Sanibel Island before. Some of you might know of Sanibel. Uh, there's the northwestern storms that come and just sweep across and dump a lot of shells on the beach there. And of course, Everybody goes to Sanibel Island is going to look for shells. So it's a big thing. There's hundreds of people doing it all the time. Now, the reality is most of the shells that get cast ashore are worn and broken from tumbling in the sand or the pounding by the waves. Uh, you can still identify most of those, but you're not going to get really good quality specimens uh, that way. Sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll find something very cool on the beach. Uh, it can happen, but it's not really likely to happen. Um, you know, and there, you can find adequate shells if you're just for fun and having the kids have a good time. Yeah, you can find some adequate ones that way. Um, now, interestingly, especially when you get down to Florida, tiny little shells of which there are hundreds of species. You can find those sifting through the drift at the high tide line. Get on your hands and knees with some glasses and, and, and just sift through the sand. 
and the, the, uh, the, the drift that's in the, in the tide line, you'll be amazed at how many species you can find. And some of them in really good condition because they're small and they can survive the waves and get washed up further up onto the beach. Um, and you can amass a great collection of small species in that way, okay? Um, next slide. So um, the good shells, which we call cabinet shells, stuff like what I'm showing you here tonight, have to be collected alive. And a lot of people are reluctant to collect live shells. And there's also laws against it in some states. You can't do that. Like in Florida, uh, you're not allowed to collect live shells and stuff like that. So responsible collecting is imperative to avoid the depletion. Um, alternatives to collecting live shells is you can find some species at the seafood markets, like I said. So you can get a few that way if you wanted to that are in good condition. Um, and also, if you're really wanting to buy cabinet specimens, then you could go to these specialty shops, like in Florida, there's some of those around in the beach towns. Or of course, where else but the internet, of course, everything is on the internet. I hate to say that too, I really, I don't want to tell you, don't look at the internet. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> but the internet uh, can bring many things to the table, not just shells, but there's everything in the world has a price on it. And so the internet turns out to be the way of the world. Everything that you can possibly imagine that can be collected may be found on the internet. So many nice shells can be bought that way as well. There's dealers who have extensive shell lists that offer them on the internet. Okay, next slide. Now, if you want to take it a little more seriously, then uh, you want to have your shells uh, labeled with your locality data and, of course, dates and things. Uh, the more the, the specific information is important, especially if you have a nice shell collection, you want to have data with it. Um, and the, uh, the collection can be organized by scientific groups, families and such and housed in a nice display box or a cabinet of sorts with drawers, right? And in closing, I'll say there's a lot of good field guides and ID books. So the Peterson, uh, field guide series, the Audubon field guide series have a shell version as well. Percy Morris, Shells of the Eastern USA is a really good book. Uh, and then my favorite authors are Tucker Abbott, um, who I met when I was a little kid. Um, he is a prolific, he, he's deceased now, but um, he's been publishing since the 60s and he wrote quite a number of books on Florida seashells, Caribbean seashells, the compendium of seashells, which I have right here. So here's the, uh, if we can go back to the uh, uh, camera, right? Here's the, uh, well, that's coming out backwards, of course, mirror image. <laughs> what do you know about that? Uh, this is the little, it's a very thin book on Florida shells, very nice book written by Tucker Abbott. Um, he wrote, this one back in the 70s, the, the uh, Kingdom of the Seashell. This has good information about the design and the um, forms of shells and all that. It's not an ID book though, not an ID book at all, but it is pretty and a lot of nice pictures and some really exquisite stuff. Um, and this is Abbott's other book. He's, he's done many like this. The um, the one I use is the Compendium of Seashells. I'm sorry, it's the mirror image, but anyway, if you can read backwards, there you go, you can see it, right? This book uh, has all the known species of shells on earth and all the obscure groups, anything you can imagine. Uh, of course, since it was published, there's been some more finds. This was published in the late 80s by Abbott and another gentleman called Peter Dance, who was the other guru of shells. Both of these guys were at the University of Delaware and the Museum of Malacology, the Shell Museum. They were uh, unbelievable and prolific publishers and writers on shells. And lastly, there's a, you can find these big coffee table books sometimes at uh, 
you know, used book places or online, whatever. This is a um, two gentlemen, Andreas Feininger and William Emerson that wrote this book on shelves. Again, not an ID book, but more of a coffee table book. But it does talk about all the groups and all the designs and beautiful pictures and stuff. So um, there's lots of resources out there. And I hope that some of you are interested in collecting and finding shells and learning about shells uh, to really find them. Um, I think, did we skip a slide? Can we go back to the PowerPoint for one second? Um, well, we're real p past time now, um, Fred, so. Oh, everybody's gonna turn into a pumpkin? I'm sorry. <laughs> No, nobody's going to turn into a pumpkin. I just want to. I just want to respect everybody's time. Yeah. If you're willing to stay on, um, I'm willing to stay on a little bit. I, I mean, I want people to don't feel that they have to. If they have other obligations to do so. Um, and I mean, this has been a fabulous presentation. We can continue to go on. And I know that some people had some questions that they did um, right. write to you um, that they wanted to have uh, answered as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. There was, there was one slide I made that had um, information on it about where to find shells. Did I skip that for some reason? I don't know. But I had listed a few places that, uh, a few kinds of habitats where people can find shells. I don't know if you saw that on the PowerPoint. Um, I don't know. And if you go back to it, you know what we could also do is anybody wants, I, we can email them the PowerPoint if they'd like to have that. That's all good. If, if, you, well, if you don't mind, I can put your email in the chat if they if they want to contact you for more information. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So places to find shells, you know, mud flats, mangroves, sandy uh, places, um, the um, reefs, of course, coral reefs, and um, littoral zone, which is the area just behind where the shoreline is going into deeper water. Lots of different types of habitats and knowing about the shells and where they live is the way to find them. And of course, you get to know about that. But um, in Florida, if you're ever there, you know, you go snorkeling in the grass flats and all that or on the reefs, you'll see different types of things there. And the mangroves host a lot of shells too. So that was on the slide that I am talking about. And of course, uh, the new finds when people finding new species come from dredging and deep water uh, um, ways. There, of course, you need boat and equipment, all sorts of things. It's not, it's not an easy thing. It's a, usually museums that fund expeditions to find new shells. So I can take some questions. If anybody would like to ask something, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, we had a couple of questions and I'll, okay. I can go back. Um, there was, um, are the patterns on the shells for camouflage? sometimes um, and many shells the cone shells uh, the conchs or the strombids they all have uh, a skin over them you can't see the colors and the skin also camouflages them down to the substrate where they live they they, they hide well in the substrate and it's called a periostracum it's it's a leathery type of skin almost that uh, when you clean the cone shells, you have to actually bleach that off of them to see the pattern on the shell. Uh, the cowrie shells, which have this beautiful high gloss that we were talking about, right? They have the mantle. And when they're living and alive and they're hiding in coral or in holes in rocks, the mantle goes up over the shell. And it's oftentimes the mantle has frilly looking material on it. Uh, it's not just a thin skin, but they have uh, patterns and frills that hide them extremely well. They could be in front of your face and you don't see them. Um, and I don't know when you were speaking about this, but that somebody asked, um, do they have opercula? Most do. And the, I'm not uh, sure what I know what a, a, an opercula is. Okay, so the opercula is the shell, when it retracts, the animal goes back inside to the shell. There's a very hard, horny type of uh, trap door that closes the shell. 
So when he retracts or she retracts into the shell, that trap door is the last thing. It's, it's attached to their foot. So when they retract, it, it creates a, a seal. And that, that operculum closes the shell, in, the animal into the shell um, so predators can't get them and all that. Some have a very small operculum, like the cone shells don't have a very big operculum, but for some reason they don't need that. Um, the uh, conch shells have uh, an operculum that looks like a, a sharp, long fingernail. There's one right there, good. What's that one from, Karen? Oh, I can't hear you. you can, Karen, go ahead and unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Karen. Still can't hear, but anyway. Usually people ask me to mute myself, not to unmute. <laughs> I, sp I spend a lot of time on the beach, uh -huh. and I have a ton of just about those things. So if you'd like to see various opercula from fish. Oh, you muted again. <laughs> Right, there's a good one right there, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So so the conch shells have a nail-like operculum that they use when they extend their and the foot out, they dig it into the sand and then they pull the shell forward. So it's used to like claw down and then the shell is pulled forward and they keep doing that and they move along that way. So some have a big operculum and some don't. Uh, sometimes the opercula is large that it will cover the aperture of the shell, sometimes not. Cowrie shells do not have an opercula, but they, they're deep inside holes and rocks, so they're protected in that way. And we have a question, what is the shell you are most excited to find? Most excited to find? Well, it had to be when I was in Hawaii and I was free diving and I collected some of these, a, cu a couple of big humpback cowrie. And they look like, this is a small one. You can see that high gloss, chocolate color, right? And these were in a cliff face big rocky area below and you had to put your arm all the way into a hole. You had to dive down and, and dive in between waves that were big waves are coming and smashing the rocks. So you had to go between the waves, look in the hole, find a hole that had one in it and then reach your arm way into the hole and pull it out. Uh, they stick very tight so you had to hold on and while you're doing this, you have to brace yourself with the other arm because the waves are coming and smashing you onto the rocks at the same time. So I got a couple big ones that way. I was thrilled to say the least. <laughs> but yeah, there's other things I can sit back and think of uh, quite a few different things that uh, really got me excited about um, shells, finding different shells. There's, yeah, go ahead, Bronwyn. No, I, I think that, that that covers all of the questions that we've that, that people have been asking. Can you tell me, is that a murex? That's a murex, yes. Murex. Okay. Yeah, that's a murex. Does anybody else have a shell that they wanted to get a, an idea from Fred? Karen is talking, but I can't, I can't hear her. Unmute yourself, Karen. You're muted. No Wait. one is ever going to believe that you said that. Truly. That no one. Unmute yourself. <laughs> exactly. Are you a I, teacher? <laughs> I'm sorry? Are you a teacher? No, I just am um, ADD with verbal diarrhea. Oh, that's okay. I'm a teacher, so I have the same affliction. I end up teaching on the beach, actually. There you go. That's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. But my craziest experience was we were in Jordan, the country of Jordan. Oh, wow, yeah. And... Um, the Bedouins all consider themselves cousins. And there was a teenager who was selling interesting rocks he had found. And I was looking at the rocks, they were very interesting, but he was using a seashell for one of the rocks to lean on. And I sent you a picture of it, but 
imagine the desert. This is a seashell from what was the Dead Sea. Oh my Dead God. Sea, really? Yes. I sent oh, you a picture. Oh, you, sent you sent it to my you... email? Okay. Yes. yes uh, I wonder if it was from the Red Sea, the Red Sea, because is it a modern shell? I don't, no, it was from, oh gosh, Miller. Where was the, we went in Jordan. What was the place, what was the place? <coughs> Vadi Rum, from Vadi Rum. Um, in Jordan. In Jordan, yes. Okay. Was the shell like a modern shell? Did it oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so it was an old, like a fossil type of thing, yeah. Correct, yeah. Okay, good, I'll have a look at it, that'd be nice. But finding a shell in the desert's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of fossil shells. Some people specialize in fossil shells only. Right. And Florida has a great deal of those, by the way. So if you're into fossils, there's a, the whole fossil shell side of the coin, which I didn't even talk about. I do have a lot of fossil shells as well, believe it or not. Right? Um, and they're, they're pretty cool too. I mean, Florida has some of the best you'll ever see for that. Well, maybe we'll have to have Fred come back and do, a, do another Zoom on fossil shells um, <laughs> for us. I don't know, but uh, yeah. there seems like this is just the tip of, tip of the... Um, the proverbial the ice shell. Shell. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I hope everybody enjoyed and learned. Uh, my brain is much bigger. I look around everybody. I see much bigger brains um, than, when we, than when you came. Uh, I want to thank Fred for sharing his knowledge, his enthusiasm, his passion, and his collection with us this evening. And I hope um, that you'll be able to check and see what we have coming up on other Thursday nights. And, and, and next Tuesday, I know that it's a little bit wonky with the schedule, but that's for the cricket crawl. If you want to learn how to ID cricket crawls and know what's, what's, what's buzzing in your backyard. So with that, I wish everybody a wonderful evening and hope to um, see you virtually soon and in person um, soon as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody for attending. I hope you all enjoyed it. And it was my pleasure to uh, speak and share with you. Hope we'll do this again sometime. And come to the Natural History Society, please. <laughs> Love to see you there. It's when it natural, opens, when it opens. When it opens, right. It's not just about shells and finding shells. You know, it's the experience going outdoors and doing things outdoors. Uh, everything's there. You can do bird watching on the beach. You know, there's a million things. Outdoors is the greatest thing you can do because you can encompass so much that way. And shell collecting is just one aspect. So anyway, take care. Everybody be safe. Wear your mask. Hi, Fred. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Great Stay to care. see all of you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Fred. You Thanks, Fred. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gene. I'll be calling you. <laughs> all right. <Okay. laughs> Good. <laughs> all right, everybody. Aaron, it was nice to talk to you. And... Um, do you live locally? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, question can... though. Huh? Uh, is there yeah. a way to contact you? Yeah, yeah, I put his email in the chat. It is bug and rockman at msn.com. Got it. Where did you send the image you were talking about the shell from Jordan? She sent, she sent them to me and I can forward oh. them on to you. Yeah, forward them to me. But oh, do you, you see my do you see my email there on the chat, Karen? I will look again. Yeah, Bug and Rockman, for obvious reasons. <laughs> spelled um, out, Bug and Rockman. Yes, yeah. spelled out at, at, at MSN. MSN. So shoot me yeah. an email, yeah, if you want to see shells or you want to talk shells or something, anytime, okay? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Glad to see the enthusiasm. <laughs> All right. Give me a call. I'm calling you, man. A What's that? I will. I say, give me a call when you get a chance, Fred, and we can get caught up. Yeah, absolutely. It was good to see you tonight, and Marshall yep. too. So yeah, we'll, well, I'll definitely call you. Okay. All right. Peace and love, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night.